afternoon. I did all of my crying before I got here, so you will be able to understand what I say. Still, I hope you will forgive me that I'm going to rely heavily on notes for reasons that are obvious. I have the honor of being uncle to 12 of the most wonderful young adults imaginable, including Jonathan and Azalea. It's an honor to speak at this celebration of his life this afternoon, though if I'm honest, I would rather be anywhere else but here. Maybe yours, your emotions like mine have been all over the map this week if you knew the Brazilia family well. Grief, bewilderment, disappointment, sadness, but also much gratitude, much hope, and much expectation that good will grow out of this tragic time. Thank you for loving the Brasilia so well as a community. Before speaking of Johnny, however, I would like to address some remarks to Kevin and Linda. It has been acknowledged over and over that Johnny was a brave young man, brave in ways that I can't begin to comprehend. He had nerves of steel, but he is not the only brave one in our family. Quite possibly not even the bravest. Linda, it has taken immense courage especially in our day and time, to accept that your call in life is to be a wife and a mother, to love your family, and to teach your children and grandchildren the way of Jesus. And it is clear to me that you never did it for praise or attention or congratulations, but simply because it was right and you cared for others more than yourself. As your brother and as the proud uncle of your seven children, I thank you for your bravery and your sacrifice. You are my hero. Kevin, as a brother-in-law, I have watched you work hard, pinch pennies, get up early, stay late, and decide, deny yourself day after day, year after year, decade after decade to show Linda and the children and the grandchildren what it means to live a long obedience in the same direction your devotion to Christ, your kindness to others, and your courage have been quiet, inconspicuous, and humble. How blessed Johnny was to have a dad like you. Thank you. And yet, as true as all of that is, I still suspect that if I were to ask Linda and Kevin to grade themselves as parents, they would probably say, well, we did the best we could, but we are woefully imperfect. I would certainly say the same of my role as an uncle. And truth be known, every parent in the room, if we are honest, would say the same. Not that we are bad parents, not that we don't care, but we are still woefully imperfect. Ben, Owen, Crash, Mary, David Andrew, have spoken about Johnny the person, the colorful and exuberant soul that he was. I would like to take a slight departure from that and speak a bit about the world that Johnny grew up in. And more importantly, more specifically, about a story he grew up with. Because I am convinced that that story, more than anything else, explains the person he was. Before Johnny was born, his mom and dad prayed for him faithfully, just as they had done for the five before him and for the one who came after him. They asked God to protect his mind, his body, and his soul so that he might blossom into the unique human being that God created him to be. They prayed those things because they knew that Johnny would be born into a world, this world, that is woefully imperfect filled with people who are selfish, proud, deceptive, indifferent, bitter. They knew, too, that sweet as he might be, he, too, would bring a measure of his own woeful imperfection into the world with him. We all do. But most of all, Kevin and Linda prayed 
that Johnny's heart would be captured by a story. A story that is contained in this book of a God who is loving, good, strong, and perfect. And so from the time that Johnny made his appearance in the big, bustling, Brasilia home, there were moments like this. I, I would like you to imagine with me. Johnny as a little boy and his mom are on the well-worn family sofa. He is in her lap or beside her, able to see the pictures in the book that she is going to read with him. A Bible for children. All of the other kids, especially Michael and David, are out of the house so there is a little bit of peace and quiet. Imagine that. And Linda begins to read. In the beginning there was nothing. Nothing to hear, nothing to feel, nothing to see, only emptiness and darkness. And nothing but nothing. But God was there. And God had a wonderful plan. I will take up this emptiness, God said. And I will fill it up. Out of the darkness, I am going to make light. And out of the nothing, I am going to make everything. Like a mama bird flutters her wings over her eggs to help her babies hatch. God hovered over the deep, silent darkness. He was making life happen. God spoke. That's all he had to do. And whatever he said, it happened. God said, hello, light. And light shone in the darkness. God, God called the light day and the darkness night. And God said, you are good. And they were. And then Linda would read about how God made the ocean and the sky and the land and the plants and the galaxies and birds and fish. Johnny would especially like this next part. Then God said, hello, animals. And everyone came out to play. The earth was filled with noisy noises, growling and gobbling and snapping and snorting and happy kerfuffling. And God said, you are good. And they were. God saw all that he had made and he loved them and they were lovely because he loved them. But God saved the best for last. For from the beginning, God had a shining dream in his heart. He would make people to share his forever happiness. They would be his children and the world would be their perfect home. So God breathed life into Adam and Eve. When they opened their eyes, the first thing they ever saw was God's face. And when God saw them, he was like a new dad. You look like me, he said. You are the most beautiful thing I have ever made. And Adam and Eve joined in the song of the stars and the streams and the wind and the trees, the wonderful song of love to the one who made them. Their hearts were filled with happiness. And nothing ever made them sad or lonely or sick or afraid. God looked at everything he had made. Perfect, he said. And it was. But all the stars and the mountains and oceans and galaxies and everything were nothing compared to how much God loved his children. He would move heaven and earth to be near them always. Whatever happened, whatever it cost him, he would always, always love them. And so it was that the wonderful love story began. Well, let's pause. If it was all so good and wonderful and perfect, then what happened? Where did death come from? More specifically, why did Johnny it's a fair question, and God loves us too much to leave such a question unanswered. But before going there, let me pause for this. You might be tempted to say to yourself, what a cute, 
charming story for a little boy as if it is nothing more than that. That is a dangerous temptation. One of the beauties of the gospel story, the gospel of Jesus Christ, is that it is accessible even to the mind and heart of a little boy or the uneducated or those who are mentally limited. At the same time, some of the greatest scholars, writers, artists, and philosophers that have ever lived in the world have spent their lifetimes pondering the life and teachings of Jesus, trying to plumb the depths of his story. Please don't dismiss this story because it is simple or comprehensible. If anything, that is an argument for its credibility. Wouldn't a good God want everyone to know how much he loves them? When God made us, we were dangerously free. Free to love him and thrive in the glad surrender to him or free to walk away from him, ignore him and make woefully imperfect kingdoms of our own. Free to be right but also free to go wrong. The book of Genesis in the Bible tells us that God gave Adam and Eve one rule. You know the story. Whether you read that as fact or allegory, you know what happened. God said, stay away from one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God said, everything else in creation is yours to enjoy and care for. Everything in ocean, earth, and sky, but not that one tree children's Bible explains it beautifully. God knew that if they ate the fruit, they would think they did not need him. And they would try to make themselves happy without him. But God knew there was no such thing as happiness without him. And life without him would not be life at all. You know, of course, what happened in the garden. Adam and Eve were deceived by God's enemy who disguised himself as a serpent. They were enticed. They were seduced by a lie. They disobeyed God and they ate the fruit. And when they did, the unraveling of creation began. Sin altered God's perfect world. And ever since then, we have been running away from him and hiding in the dark. Sin has rendered us unable or unwilling to trust that there is a God, much less a God, who loves and cares for us. We are broken, fearful, and lost. As one writer puts it, God is at home. We are in the far country. With Adam and Eve's disobedience, this world became a place of woeful imperfection. It is still filled with beauty and wonder, with sunsets and seasons. We see the fingerprints of God at every turn. I can only imagine some of the sights that, that Johnny and Crash have seen from the altitude at which they live their lives. But even so, the world is infinitely less than it was meant to be. Genesis tells us that Adam and Eve were evicted from the garden and that ever since then, their children us, we, have been on a long, long journey far from our true home. We still bear the image of God, each and every one of us, but we also carry the DNA of Adam, the part of us that says, I want to be in control. I cannot, I will not trust a God I cannot see. I will not surrender to a God who runs his world so poorly. That is not the end of the story. Imagine that Linda turns the page. And she reads, Johnny, do you have any questions? Johnny didn't start to read till he was late. Is that right? Seven or eight years old. I think we had a talk about this. I mean, I was concerned for him. <laughs> Johnny did not read until he was like a kid. I mean, but Johnny listened. Johnny listened. And maybe he got more from listening than many of us, most of us, all of us get from, from reading. He caught up, of course. So maybe he didn't have any questions that day, Linda. He just listened. And you read to him before 
Adam and Eve left the garden, God gently clothed them and then sent them away. But God loved his children. Loved them too much to let the story end there. Even though he knew he would suffer, God had a magnificent plan. One day he would get his children back. One day he would make the world their perfect home again. And one day he would wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see, no matter what, in spite of everything, God would love his children with a never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always, forever love. And though they, though we, would forget him and run from him deep in their hearts, deep in our hearts, deep in his heart. God's children would miss him always and long for him. Lost children yearning for their home. Before they left the garden, God whispered a promise to Adam and Eve. It will not always be so. I will come. I will come to rescue you. And when I do, I am going to do battle against the snake. I will get rid of the sin and the dark and the sadness. I'm coming back for you. And we would. One day God himself would come. That's a big story for a little boy. But even little boys, sometimes bigger than big boys, like us, can begin to grasp it. And they can grow up with it. And they can grow up into the story themselves. Because no matter how much we learn about the heart and love of God, there is always more. We never age out of the story. So death entered the world. And every day it shows its ugly face in floodwaters, in war zones, in hospitals, in marriages, in dreams. And sometimes on beautiful afternoons in the mountains of Utah. But God would not, and even today will not, let death have the final word. God hates death because he loves life. Because he loves you. And because he loves me. In the gospel. God promised that his own son, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, would come to undo the fall and overcome the curse. And centuries before he was born, the prophets and the poets pointed to a day that the Savior would come to be born in this world. And God kept his promise. We celebrate that birth every year at Christmas. And we, we visit every year the imponderable truth that God became flesh and lived among us. Jesus was one of us, but without any woeful imperfection. Mary was his mom. Joseph was his stepfather. He worked as a carpenter. He preached and taught. He did miracles. He befriended all manner of people. In our day, I think you might have found him at the jump zone crash. He spoke frequently about something called the kingdom of God, a kingdom built on love for God, love for others, and love for even ourselves. And he spoke frequently and passionately about life. If you have a heart like Johnny's today, if you hunger to live life deeply and authentically, listen to what the Lord Jesus said about himself. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. I am the way and the truth and the life. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never be hungry. I am the living waters. I am the resurrection and the life. And on and on. He spoke emphatically about the very thing that we all most deeply desire life that is truly life. 
it's hard to fathom. But Jesus, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Love, was not welcome in our world of woeful imperfection. He met a mountain of opposition and was murdered by a mob. He was shamelessly put on public display as a criminal because he loved us too much to leave us as we are. The perfect Son of God was crucified, dead, and buried for you, for me, for him. To take away our woeful imperfection and give us his glorious perfection. And when he was on the cross and in the grave, his friends were probably as bewildered and frightened and maybe as disappointed as some of us are today. But then there was the proclamation of triumph. Linda and, Ke Linda and Kevin, I dare say, you will never hear these words quite the same ever again. He is risen. Christ is risen indeed. He wingsuited home and someday he will come back to this world again. He undid death to bring us home, to rescue us from the far country. At the end of time, when the final chapter of this world is written, the scriptures tell us that death will be swallowed up by life. But in the meantime, until that day, what do we do? We live. We sing and dance and eat and skydive and write books and play with our children and plant gardens and make love and go to football games and swim in the ocean and laugh and talk and cry together. We learn, we grow, we worship, we care for one another. We take care of the creation. We help each other find our way home. We share the story that Johnny heard from his mom and dad. And sometimes, sometimes, we put our arms around the mother who has lost her little boy and the dad who cannot save his children from their grief. We live, in short, to make God happy and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We do so knowing that we will all die one day, but we do so with hopeful confidence that because Jesus defeated death, we can live with him forever. This is the story that Johnny grew up with. It was in the air that he breathed. It was at every meal. It was every moment he shared with you. As a little boy, he heard it. As an infant, he heard it. As an adolescent and young adult, because of him, he heard it. He wrestled with it. And he labored in his own unique and woefully imperfect way to find his place in the story. Like any of us who have tried to live out the Christian faith in a world that does not very much, that does not very much like him at times, the Lord Christ, Johnny had questions, dry seasons and dark nights of the soul. But our hope today is not in Johnny's ability to conquer all his doubts or questions. It is not in his accomplishment, or his bravery, or his charm, or his moral code. Our hope is in the never stopping, never giving up, unbreaking, always and forever love of God. Even a weak and struggling faith in the name of Christ leads to a safe landing. I should bring this to a close. Last Saturday night, the Bazilia family sat around the dining room table to write an obituary for Johnny. It seemed almost blasphemous to use 
language for so bitter a task. But even in that, there was sweetness that could only have come from God at such a moment. One of these days, one of these days, someone will have to write your obituary. What will it say? Today we all have the same choice that faced Adam and Eve in the garden. We have the freedom to be right or to be wrong. We can choose to walk as children of God in the garden or we can walk away and meet him as an adversary on the battlefield. We can worship the true God or we can choose smaller, more convenient gods with a small g. The options are many, money, career, power, pleasure, popularity, adrenaline, knowledge, but none of those will save us. And on days like today, they are worthless. Since bravery is on our minds this afternoon, might I suggest that the bravest thing any of us will ever do is admit our weakness, confess our own woeful imperfection, and surrender to the God who can turn death to life, weakness into strength, and failure to blessing. It is not only the bravest, it is the wisest thing that you will ever do. Maybe today you will say yes to the life that is truly life. He has a name, Jesus. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal once observed that there are two categories of wise people in the world. Those who serve God with all of their hearts because they know him. And those who seek God with all of their hearts because they know him not. Might God make us wise this day as you say farewell to your friend, as you say farewell to your nephew, as you say farewell to your cousin, as you say farewell to your brother, as you say farewell to your son, and as I say farewell, my dear boy, Johnny, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.